All right. So um, there's an unfortunate title in the in the um, in the in the uh, agenda there. When we first started talking about this, I was they said, "Can you just talk about something other than?" And I thought they said mice and rats because I know Joe was going to speak and he talks very well, obviously about mice. And I thought, "Oh, he must be doing rats. I'll just do other rodents." And they and I said, "What other rodents?" And they said, "You pick." So I thought over the next month or two, I, I would remember and actually send a more, a more descriptive title. So it ended up in the agenda as other rodents. So what I decided to uh, pick here, let me find the clicker or to talk about today, is guinea pigs and hamsters. And the reason I picked those is once you get away from mice, which is, and Joe are, are actually, uh, you may know, ALAS counted this once, how many mice are used in research every year? I mean, it's yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but it's multiples of millions. And then it probably drops down to rats, and maybe it's in the neighborhood of one or two million. I don't really know. And then you get down into guinea pigs and hamsters, and they're significantly smaller numbers, but they certainly still play important roles in research. So according to the USDA that collects this data yearly, and this is data from 2009 and 2010 averaged together, there's about a little over 200,000 guinea pigs used annually in the U.S. and about 150,000 hamsters. Um, interestingly, when I went back and tried to find more recent data to see if this is still trending downwards or if it's flat, uh, I, I was going to ask AWIC later. I can't find that data anywhere on the web more recently than 2010. So we turned this in annually. I think it's 2014, so you'd think 11, 12, or 13 would be floating out there somewhere, but I couldn't find it. So today we're going to review some of the natural environment and behavior of these guys, and much like Joe, Joe pointed out and, and Bernie on the first day, uh, the, the natural behavior, the telos, the uh, guinea pigness of a guinea pig, it's important to understand that as we look at how we're going to house them in the laboratory, how we're going to meet those needs, uh, natural needs or innate needs that they seem to have that are beneficial, how do we let them control their environment in some fashion. And, and is there data out there to show that that's actually beneficial for research? Both of these species, there's certainly not as much data as Joe just reviewed briefly about the mice, but there's a little bit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about their social structure and behavior, both in the wild and laboratory setting, and then um, a couple recommendations for laboratory housing. So we're going to start with guinea pigs. Um, if you guys are taxonomists and you're interested, the taxonomy is here. Cavia porcellus is the common guinea pig. I'll give you a little anecdote here. We, we, uh, Charles River uh, produces both hamsters and guinea pigs in the U.S. and in Europe. We also produce guinea pigs in a facility near Montreal, Canada. And roughly 50% of that production in Canada sources down to the U.S. to support biomedical research. And twice now in the last year and a half, the Fish and Wildlife at the border has stopped our trucks and said, you need a wildlife permit to bring a guinea pig in the United States. And if you look at U.S. Fish and Wildlife guidelines on what's a wild animal, a wild animal is all those sorts of things we think of, tigers and lions and elephants. But it specifically says white rats are not wild animals, uh, white mice are not wild animals, and white rabbits as well as sheep and goats and the common livestock. So occasionally we get border inspectors that stand, wait a minute, I have to adhere to the rule directly, specifically, technically, and I can't use judgment here. So um, we've had to get special permits twice, and then they've changed their minds twice. So right now we're in that process again, actually appealing it up through the Fish and Wildlife Service in Washington, D.C., asking for an exemption that guinea pigs really are not wild animals. We've pointed out, um, this made us go back and look at the natural history of the guinea pig. Turns out there's actually no free-living guinea pigs, cavia porcellus, anywhere in the world right now. There are probably one, between one and three strains that were probably the derivative or the, or the origin of our research in pet guinea pig, but natural free-living guinea pigs as we know them here, um, actually this is a capybara, so they don't look like that, like that but um, do not exist in the wild. They originated in South America, the Andes, uh, mountainous areas primarily, Peru. They've been domesticated an awfully long time, as early as 5000 BC, and they were domesticated primarily as a food source. So they were raised, and guinea pig, varieties of guinea pigs are still raised for food. And guinea pigs have been proposed, actually, as a, as a uh, 
species that underdeveloped areas could raise. They're, they have a fairly fast reproductive rate. They produce decent sized litters um, and, they, and they're a size that could be a food source. So they've actually been talked about as should they be introduced to areas where they're having trouble having a, um, an easy to raise small, uh, small scale farming that could produce a meat, a meat source. They were introduced to Europe somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, mid 1500s to the early 1600s. Uh, there was actually the earliest dated European guinea pig comes out of a little town in Belgium and with, uh, with carbon dating, they showed that it was probably a pet in a uh, wealthy household. So it uh, dates back as a pet uh, a couple hundred years as well. First described in research in the 1700s and again, as we know the guinea pig, uh, there are no free living ones uh, in the wild at the, um, in the world. So laboratory stocks and strains, they're all, they have a pretty uniform body conformation in size. They, they all look very similar with the difference of coat coloration. The primary guinea pig used in research are outbreds and in particular Hartland or Duncan Hartley. And you see the top picture here is an albino short haired animal. The one down below is a hairless euthymic or normal immune system, but a hairless guinea pig. Uh, those are the two um, that Charles River produces. Uh, there are other vendors that produce the uh, haired guinea pig also in the US. There, there is an NIH outbred. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not commercially available. I think there are one or two academic colonies in the country. Uh, so they're probably available in very small numbers somewhere, but I don't know where that is. And then there's inbred strains, strain two and strain 13. Again, to my knowledge, there's no uh, commercial colony for these. Uh, so they may be available from a small academic or research um, facility somewhere. So their natural behavior, wild uh, cavies are group living animals. They tend to live in small groups. Uh, the descriptions in the literature vary anywhere from five to eight uh, to as many as 15 to 24 with small groups. Usually one adult male and one or several females and their unweaned uh, offspring. They're, act they, they're described as active both day and night and that they don't sleep but they nap. Um, I think in a laboratory setting they seem to, well they're act they are certainly act more active during the day than perhaps mice and rats. Um, uh, whether or not they sleep, I don't know. Uh, they don't dig burrows, but they will, uh, they, they, move, they move through underbrush in tunnels, um, uh, either created by other game or, or, or that they can create. So they, they do hide under structures, under, under underbrush, and I'll show you later how, how we're trying to use that and we're investigating that. Is it one way to provide them uh, an enriched environment without giving them a true hut? So they're born precocious and nearly self-sufficient. And actually, uh, we recently did a pilot project to redrive guinea pigs. And we simply did C-sections and raised them without uh, nursing and put them on the moist diet at the time of birth. And about 60% survived. So they, they, um, they do not need to nurse. In a commercial setting, we wean them between one and two weeks of age. If you let them wean naturally, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 25, 30 days of age. The females are readily a, 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 uh, readily accept fosters of, of other females' pups, and so group rearing is certainly possible. Uh, females reach sexual maturity very early, around 30 days, and males, it's, it's closer to two months. And at least in, ca in captivity, mature pups are readily accepted into domestic groups, but in the wild, the males will injure or kill sons, um, uh, their own sons or unrelated sons as, as they mature. If you guys have ever worked with guinea pigs or had a child that had a guinea pig in their bedroom, these guys are vocal. They're vocal in our auditory range. You certainly know when they're happy, sad, upset. It's, uh, there's been 11 different calls described for these guys, everything from a chut to a chutter to a whine to a purr to a scream. Uh, okay, my screen just went black. That's the screen itself or the keyboard? There we go. Um, and was what I thought was interesting is they were described as having the first tweet before, um, um, uh, before the internet was, was, was uh, developed. So it's a very complex repertoire of vocalizations and in particular between the moms and the pups. And if you remove a mom uh, with, the, with the youngsters in the cage, they will emit a very uh, distress oriented sound that the mothers respond to. And the mothers can pick out distress sounds of their pups versus distress sounds of other pups. So it's certainly a very important part of their socialization with, with each other. It's been described that their behavioral repertoire really hasn't changed much with domestication. 
and that's from looking at what wild cavies are, are still uh, running around. Uh, the behavioral frequencies of some of those behaviors are different, and in general, it's been described that they're more sociopositive or less aggressive towards each other. So by bringing them into captivity and either through selective breeding or just a captive setting um, over the years, uh, they seem to be a less aggressive. In, in, a breeding, um, in a breeding area that are large rooms where we have you know, thousands of these cages breeding groups of animals, fighting is almost unheard of. Uh, and I very rarely hear concerns from research institutions that deal with fighting. So again, social structure, small groups, primarily five to 10 individuals. They will actively seek contact with one another. They, they, they certainly are a social species. Interestingly though, when they've, when they've either produced large mixed sex colonies or in the wild, within a large mixed sex colony, they will break off into, there'll still be one dominant male for the group, but they will develop small groups of uh, males and females with subordinate males over those small groups uh, that can all coexist within the same general space. So um, uh, Joe, can, uh, Joe can comment if mice will do that in those large settings he described, but to me this was, was interesting. I hadn't seen this described before. And in the wild, they don't seem to maintain an exclusive territory. I think they spend a great deal of time foraging and, and moving about, but they're not st as strictly territorial as perhaps some of the other, some of the other rodents. They do have a complex social interaction. Each sex has its own linear dominance hierarchy. And in the wild, subordinate animals will retreat or attack when the, primarily when the dominant male is involved. And there's a well-described repertoire of aggressive behaviors with stand threats and head thrusts and attack, should be attack lunges, um, so much like the other rodents. But the domesticated guinea, guinea pig that we use in research, those aggressive behaviors seem to be dramatically absent or at least dampened. And the primary aggressive behavior we'll see, at least in our, in our breeding colonies and sometimes in a research setting, is hair pulling and, and ear nibbling. Doesn't usually escalate to frank fighting. And again, in mixed groups in the laboratory, males will form these small harems. And it's been described as a bonding or an attachment-like social bond between the males and the females that can be long-lived and fairly strong. And when these familiar partner males are available to the females, they've also showed that they can buffer the cortical cortisol responses in the blood to females that are exposed to novel environments. So it seems to be comforting or, or supportive to, uh, to guinea pigs. So I think that what it drives the message home is these really are social animals. They do well with, uh, certainly uh, in the wild and in the laboratory, um, they uh, uh, should, should be housed socially whenever possible. Early, early experience uh, certainly matters. And there's, there's been studies with males, not a great deal with females, but males reared in isolation. So right after weaning show aggression when they're introduced to other single males. So there's a, there's a learning and, and behavioral repertoire that they learn when they're with one another as they're, as they're, uh, as they're maturing. And, th and that if that's absent, um, they are more aggressive towards one another. And when you introduce one of these isolated males into a colony of multiple um, other guinea pigs, not only does the male that was raised in isolation suffer and have aggressive behavior directed towards it, it aggressive towards the others, but there can actually be effects through, uh, throughout the, that larger group of animals showing reduced weight loss. And in one publication described actually death of animals when you introduce this, this novel or strange male into a stable group. Females tend to be more adaptive, so they, and they don't tend to, tend to show this um, uh, effect of isolation and then being put into a larger group or a group of, of unfamiliar, they, they seem to adapt readily to it. And this, this graph over here is, is simply trying to show that the isolation, these animals, when you uh, take an isolated male and drop it into a larger group or expose it to, a, um, to another uh, male it hasn't met before, you will see increases in serum cortisol in addition to the aggression. Guinea pigs don't handle novelty well, but they also seem to be easily startled or threatened by uh, both novelty um, noises. Uh, in one of our facilities where we use quite a few guinea pigs, we were having guinea pigs that were stampeding and injuring, injuring each other as people uh, walked by as strangers such as myself. If I'd go in the room as the vet in my white jacket, they would freak out and run around the cage and stampede. When the normal husbandry staff came in, they were fairly calm. So we actually ended up putting what we called visual barriers up so that as I walked down the hallway and they saw my flash of light 
uh, the guinea pigs wouldn't react and stay calmer based on observational studies that we performed in the room. But they really have two reactions when they're startled or threatened. And it's either to freeze, which sounds just like you, you'd expect, they hold still, or to stampede. And the stampede is really the more worrisome in a research setting. It can certainly cause trauma to themselves, especially if you're on a wire bottom floor in caging system, such as a tox setting. They can entrap limbs in that wire floor and injure themselves. They can trample young and end up killing young. Years ago, we bred animals at a higher density than we do now. And one of the reasons we reduced the, uh, the uh, density is we were having trampling of animals and the young were suffering in these cages. And when we dropped, simply pulled one female guinea pig out of the group house breeding cage, our infant mortality or neonatal mortality essentially went to zero. So it was as simple as one too many animals in, in this, in this um, uh, relatively large group cage. And it's been described to lead to abortions in, in pregnant sows. One way to combat that is certainly provide them a shelter and they will retreat into a shelter uh, if, if, if it's provided. So as Joe, point, Joe pointed out earlier, you really can't talk about social housing as an isolated uh, parameter when we're talking about any of the species that we're dealing with. You have to look at the overall cage or living environment. And for guinea pigs, shelters are very important. In the wild, they run under underbrush, they follow tunnels under underbrush. Uh, to stay away from predation, um, stay out of view. If you provide guinea pigs a shelter, and actually these, gu these guinea pigs that we um, perform cesarean re-derivations on uh, at um, several hours old, we put an inverted mouse cage in, the ca in a large group cage with the sides cut off so it was more like a garage where they could enter and leave. And at that age, they were migrating into the shelter. So it's certainly a very strong natural draw they have. Um, they don't dig, so giving them nesting material, they may burrow into it, push under it, but they won't dig a nest, they won't build a tunnel through, through that material. They will use burrows excavated by other animals, which is hard to mimic in a research setting, but in the wild they will. So certainly it's important to provide these guys with some kind of shelter, some kind of protection from, um, uh, in their, uh, I guess, uh, native behavior, some kind, of, some kind of protection from predation. So there have been studies that have showed the benefits of shelters. It's not just a common sense. There's some data behind all this, that if you provide paired guinea pigs with a hut, it lowers daily fecal cortisol concentrations. Um, and if you compare types of shelters, I know it's, uh, there are, the top picture here is a through and through shelter, so the animal can enter one side and leave the other. And at least there's some evidence to suggest maybe they like a one-way tunnel where they can come in and back back out or turn around and come back out versus a through and through tunnel. So the recommendation here, I think, is pretty simple. We should socially house whenever possible. If you do need to isolate guinea pigs, especially if you're going to isolate guinea pigs right after birth, you're probably going to change their behavior repertoire later on when they're introduced to others, certainly males. And certainly from a commercial standpoint, we raise them as groups. So they're coming in preconditioned to, to being group housed. And that's certainly going to be the, uh, the um, setting that they would uh, probably prefer in a, in a research setting. But we also have to remember that the overall housing environment is also important. You should provide some kind of a solid floor with bedding. It's going to minimize uh, limb injuries, pododermatitis, broken, broken legs, which still occur in talk settings. Provide some, some kind of a shelter or hut. And if possible, put them in a low, low traffic, low noise area. They do startle. They can become accustomed to noises. We actually um, uh, will play radios in the, in the housing rooms during the light time when the uh, staff members are in there. And we've seen that if the radio breaks for some reason and we haven't replaced it yet, the general excitability of the animals goes up when there's not that background level of, of low noise going on. This picture here was to show something that um, I think is, this is a, when you look at their native behavior in the wild, they like to hide under things, bushes, brush, et cetera. This is one of our large breeding pens. So this is, a, this is in one of our commercial breeding rooms. And it's a large uh, bedded cage with a group of females and a male and a feed hopper over here. It's very difficult to put a tunnel in there or a tunnel, a hut that can accommodate all those guinea pigs. So we wondered, well, can we just give them a shade, a sun awning? If in, if in the wild they will retreat under things because that gives them comfort or, or protection, is it as simple as doing that in a, in a large cage? And that's what you're seeing here is a black piece of um, rigid plastic laid over the cage. And we have actually observational studies that will be published soon 
uh, showing that they will spend a great deal of their time under this under this shadowed area or undercover. So in our, and we haven't adopted this across the board yet, but it, this looks like a way that we can meet their need to provide some kind of shelter without putting a shelter in every one of these cages. The problem with a shelter in every one of these cages, you see this little food hopper back here. Some of these guinea pigs, there's not very many, the young ones, can use this food hopper as a launch pad, squeeze through those bars, jump up on the cage, and they go shooting across the room on top of the cages. And so anything we put in there as a launch pad just gives them a stepping stone to get out of the cage, and we'd have to modify several thousand cage tops with, with more bars, where something as simple as this may suffice to give them a shelter and, um, and, and give them that behavioral need without uh, just keeping them all ladders to escape and run around the room. And of course, the day they do that is typically when the USDA inspector uh, is, is, on, is, um, is on site, which happened once a couple of years ago. So it was, I thought it was pretty funny. The plant manager wasn't so, uh, didn't find it so humorous. And actually, I think uh, to the USDA's credit, they, were, they certainly un understood what was going on. It's the first time in 30 years they'd ever seen it. It wasn't written up as an issue, but uh, we certainly found it funny. All right. So we're going to move to hamsters. Have any of you ever seen this? I saw it last week just surfing the web. So back in the, in the 40s when hamsters became um, a more common pet in North America, this was a little company down in Alabama that, that put this ad out in Mechanics Illustrated, probably other publications as well. Well, there was a, um, a teenager, and I don't know where he's from, uh, that purchased six of these and set them up as a breeding colony. He worked for the local A&P. After about two years, he quit his job at the A&P, and the uh, local manager for the store said, I'm going to keep your job open because this hamster thing's never going to work. Well, he ended up turning this little hamster colony into a colony that he sold to Harlan um, at one point, and this, this was the origin of the Harlan hamster colony. Uh, I don't know when they bought it, but I think he did just fine for himself. He actually, he and his two brothers ended up running this colony and ultimately selling it to a commercial vendor. So. Uh, I just think it's funny. It talks about they're, they're cute, they're cuddly, they're delightful. <laughs> if you pick up any pet, any book on hamsters at Amazon or any lab animal text on hamsters, within the first couple of sentences, it will say they're aggressive and they bite. <laughs> and so this is what we decided was the great pet for our, for our kids. <coughs> so they certainly are a rodent. Um, the Syrian golden hamster, the one that we commonly use in research, is Mesocrucitus aratus the picture here. There are a number of other hamsters, I'll show you pictures in a moment, um, that you'll certainly see in pet stores and that are used in research in smaller numbers. So laboratory hamsters are believed to have originated from a single group of four litter mates that were imported into the U.S. in the 1930s. I can't find evidence that were, there were subsequent infusions. It's hard to imagine there wasn't over, over those years. But if, if this is literally true, then it certainly tells us there was a bottleneck in their genetics at some point. They're considered an outbred now, and they're maintained as an outbred. But if they really came down to one litter of four individuals, they're probably not as diverse as their wild counterparts would, counterparts would be. These are some of the other hamsters you'll see in research once in a while, the European hamster, the Chinese hamster, and the Siberian hamster. And if you go to Petco and wander the aisle, you'll see all sorts of these pet or fancy hamsters that are usually described as being derivatives of the Syrian hamster. So their natural environment is an arid, dry area, Syria, um, rocky plains and light vegetation with very sparse resources. Although this is, this is about social housing and we often house these guys socially, in, in nature these guys live in burrows as solitary animals. Males have their burrow, females have their burrow, and when the two meet they fight. Um, they're more omnivorous in the wild than, than uh, we treat them in captivity. They'll eat insects, um, fruit, as well as you know, grains and plant roots. This is kind of interesting that in, in, in a lab, most of us would describe them as nocturnal. They're active during, during the dark cycle. Studies that look at them out, out in the wild describe them as either diurnal or crepuscular in the wild. So we certainly have changed their, at least their activity um, budget by bringing them into the laboratory. And something that I don't fully understand is that they tell you to pro approach with caution a sleeping hamster during the light cycle. Uh, I can't imagine that if I'm a 50, 100 gram animal and someone picks my cage up, pulls it out of the rack, puts it on a table, and then opens the top, I've probably woken up. 
But every text out there says when they're sleeping, don't bother them. I don't know how you don't not bother them if you have to do something with them. I don't think they're as, as, as aggressive if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're um, not overly aggressive with handling them. There's ways to pick them up so you don't have to cut them in your hands necessarily. But they're always described as being this very aggressive, difficult to deal with animal. And I know in our setting where we use relatively large groups of hamsters, bite wounds with the hamsters are extremely unusual. So it's probably a combination of acclimation of the staff on how to work with them and acclimation of the animals to the setting. Unlike the guinea pig, these guys do live in burrows. They're very fastidious, and if you've worked with hamsters for long, you'll notice in the cage there's usually an area where they hoard the food in one corner. If you give them nesting material, they build a nest in another corner, and often the predominant amount of feces and urine is in a, is in a third spot. And this is their native behavior in the wild. They'll usually have a, a burrow with multiple um, sections or sub-burrows where they'll devote one to defecation and urination or the toilet area, another one for food storage, and then one where they nest and sleep. Again, they are solitary in the wild. Females is one female in her litter, and the males live alone um, almost exclusively with the exception of the, of the brief interactions when they mate. And they will hibernate when temperatures drop, drop low enough. Oops, hit that too many times. So communication, they may be a solitary animal, but certainly they need to communicate with each other. And scent is one important communication means for them. This picture on the top is showing you the uh, flank scent gland, and then there's a ventral scent gland on the uh, belly as well. We occasionally get calls from clients that order these that aren't familiar with them, and they'll report that they have tumors on their flanks and tumors on their, on their abdomens. Uh, they're not tumors, they're a, they're a natural scent marking gland. So don't be surprised if you see them. In males, the uh, ventral gland gets quite um, uh, enlarged uh, as the animals go into sexual maturity. And this, the use of scent is, is as important as the hamster as it's been described with, uh, with mice. It's used, um, they, they can leave scent both in urine and feces and these, and these glandular secretions. And it, it communicates things like dominance rank, territory, resource marking. Uh, the females will, um, they have a, vaginal discharge that also has a scent to it and that, and that will identify to uh, males that the female is receptive and willing to mate. It's used as territorial marking, uh, especially the uh, flank gland. Communication and vocal communication is also important and what's important to remember here is these guys vocalize or communicate at a at a level, at a frequency well above our usual ability to hear. And what this is showing, this is the hamster here, and if you look at this is human, um, human hearing range in the dark bar is, is what can be, is soft noises that can be detected, so you're, and then if really loud noises, your, your frequency uh, grows in both directions. So we stop, um, we overlap with the hamster a little bit. As we age, this side of the bar starts shrinking back. So these guys, They'll certainly make noises that we can hear, fighting, that sort of thing, but there's probably lots of ultrasonic communications going on that we have no, um, no easy way to understand or even measure, unless you're in there with some kind of a measuring device that can get up into the ultrasonic frequencies. It's certainly surrounding mating behavior. There are ultrasonic, in this range of 32 to 42 kilohertz, there's ultrasonic um, vocalizations going on. And these vocalizations seem to both influence both the male and, and, and the female, um, as well as odor and ester cycle. Um, and somehow facilitate mating. So much like the other rodents we work with, we need to remember the guinea pig, much of, although it, they certainly emit noises above what we can commonly hear, we certainly, they're a very rich repertoire that we can hear. These guys probably have a somewhat rich repertoire that we have no easy way to understand or, or, or ascertain. And then social interactions, these guys fight. Everything you pick up talks about their fighting, their territorial behavior. They come together for a couple of reasons, fighting over territory or mating as adults. The females attract the mates by leaving this vaginal scent trail when they're fertile. If males try to interact with the female when they're not in this fertile stage, the females will fight and sometimes fight to the point of killing the male. They're receptive to the uh, male for about a week period and they show the classic lordosis. Um, right around estrus. And interesting, at least in the wild, following mating, 
the female will chase the male um, from her nest, retrieve his food, and take it. So uh, <laughs> um, we don't see that in the commercial breeding area. But again, uh, I think the cage is small enough. There's, there's not two dens to worry about. But um, it's a pretty aggressive behavior. There are social interactions prior to sexual maturity. So the adolescents will play fight is right around 15 days of age. And this peaks out around 35, 40 days of age. And it's things like tumbling and pinning without establishment of, don of dominance, without uh, actual uh, damage or injury to each other. And then this tends to decrease as they get older than roughly 40 days and they reach sexual maturity in that neighborhood of 40, 50 days. And at that point, uh, it can transition over to actual fighting, particularly if it mixed uh, males that haven't been around each other. So this is where it becomes confusing, that hamsters are certainly aggressive. There are studies out there that have looked at co-housing of hamsters, both those that have been isolated prior and those, those that have been group housed all along. And up to 40% of group housed hamsters show some degree of evidence of fighting in, in at least this one study. Sorry, I lost my screen again. Certainly female hamsters become aggressive at puberty, both towards females and certainly towards males and separation may be necessary if you're co-housing co them. And in, in forced group housing of adult females um, has shown to result in, in increased heart rate, core body temperature, activity, and adrenal gland weight. So they're certainly, um, they certainly may be intolerant depending on probably their early experiences on how they handle group interactions as they mature. But, but despite being a solitary species in the wild and despite being aggressive and they do fight, most laboratory hamsters are group housed. For anyone in here that has hamsters, do you group house them? Someone, yeah, I see a couple hands go up. We certainly do in our research settings and we certainly do in our, in our breeding setting. And it appears that prior experience can be really important in hamster behavior as it relates to social housing. And when given a choice, hamsters have shown preference for social housing. So this has been shown a couple different ways and I've highlighted one here. If you take animals at weaning and either isolate them or group house them, group housed male hamsters will spend more time in social proximity or social contact than singly housed hamsters. 71% of their awake time, they'll be in close proximity to other hamsters and 100% of their sleeping time in this particular study. But even singly housed hamsters that are isolated at weaning, if you provide them the opportunity, and these were cages that were connected with tunnel arrangements so the animals could get close to one another if they wished, 50% of the awake time, even singly housed animals, hamsters, animals were in close proximity to um, hamsters they hadn't, they hadn't met before. They dropped down a little bit at sleeping, but roughly 47. So we're looking at about 50% of the time they would seek out at least close proximity to other hamsters, even if they were raised in isolation. And there's been some work that shows socially housed hamsters show submissive behavior at closer proximity. So they, their tolerance of another strange male seems to be improved uh, if, they're, if they're group housed from, from weaning. And the commercial breeders house hamsters in same-sex groups post weaning. So when you order hamsters, you receive hamsters, you're receiving preconditioned hamsters that have been in a group setting. So they should be amenable to group housing at your end if they're, in, if they're kept in stable groups. So the recommendations are pretty simple. Young, li young litter mates can and should be housed together. We certainly do that in a commercial breeding setting and we certainly do it in our research settings as well at Charles River. Group housing of adult animals is generally successful. Again, if you bring them in as, as, uh, as preconditioned groups where they're used to one another, they know each other, it, it can be successful. But certainly mixing strange, meaning novel or unknown, sexually mature hamsters with one another uh, certainly raises the risk of fighting, can lead to fighting, and those guys probably need, need separation if you see aggression. And just like the guinea pig and mice earlier that Joe talked about, the rest of the environment is as important as the social, <coughs> as the social setting that, that we have them in. Preference testing in hamsters has showed they prefer solid floors with bedding over slotted or wire bottom floors. I don't think many of us would have issue with that. You should provide cage on the, on the food on the cage floor for hamsters, and actually the USDA regulations specifically say hamsters can be fed on the cage floor, and that's really for two reasons. It allows them to, to um, perform this hoarding behavior so they can move food around and congregate it in one part of the cage, 
And depending on the wire bar lid you have, the wire bars can be too, can be too thin and the animals with their broad snout can actually have trouble eating from the wire bar lid. And it's been documented to show weight loss um, and even depth. So feeding on the cage floor is an excellent idea. And then provide nesting material. They will nest. It's a hoarding material. They'll interact with it. It's beneficial for thermal regulation. And um, uh, I think from a thermal regulation and your study endpoint um, data, it's, it's certainly important. And as Joe pointed out earlier, we're housing these guys in an environment that's much colder than, than their thermal neutral zone and certainly much colder than their wild, wild habitat. And nesting material is one way to address that. So I feel a little deficient. I didn't have nice videos for you, but um, um, I think guinea pigs, it's, it's really pretty simple. Why would we not socially house them? The hamster literature is a little more confusing. Several of those references I provided, and if you're interested, um, uh, I'm happy to share this with you, and I have hamsters, or hamsters and guinea pig references here. Several of the references that talk about social housing, group housing, and isolation and the, and the downstream effects of that make recommendations that we really should only singly house these guys. And um, I don't think the industry has listened to that. I also think there's enough evidence out there, both, both seat of the pants evidence that we've learned by doing it, as well as what few studies have looked at it, that socially housing of hamsters is fine if we do it correctly, um, do it in a way where the hamsters have an ability to have a stable group. The cage should be large enough that if they want to retreat from one another, they can. We've you can certainly keep bonded breeding pairs together for prolonged periods of time. The female will occasionally go after the, after the male after she's mated, but we've had success in experimental settings with keeping them together for multiple litters. The literature would argue that that's not possible, but it certainly is possible. If you have a management program to identify when aggression occurs and separate them if you need, 